Hello, adventurer. If you're looking for the best way to explore all of the zoos in Mandai, Singapore, you're in the right place. I've helped thousands of people create beautiful core memories in their visit to the zoos, but I've never done an integrated guide. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you my full itinerary and answer some of your most frequently asked questions, such as, is it possible to go all the four zoos in one day? Which zoo should you go first? Which ticket should you buy? We'll cover all that and a lot more to help you craft your most memorable visit to Mandai, Singapore. Let's begin. Let me give you a quick overview of the Mandai Wildlife Preserve. Here we have the Singapore Zoo, where you can meet many animals from all over the world, like the elephants, lions, cheetahs, and the orangutans. And in bird paradise, you get to meet all kinds of birds, including the swimming birds and the flightless birds. The river wonders, where you get to meet unique aquatic animals, like the manatees, otters, capybaras, and the giant panda, though I never really understood why they put him in the river wonders. And the night safari, where you can meet nocturnal animals that you would otherwise completely miss or never want to meet in the middle of the night. There's a fifth one coming in 2025 that focuses on rainforest animals. We'll come back for that. The super important thing that you must know is that Bird Paradise is in Mandai West, while the Singapore Zoo Night Safari and the River Wonders is at Mandai East. To get from East to West, you can easily take the free shuttle bus or the public bus. Now, let's get to our perfect itinerary. For each of the exhibits, I'll also give a ranking out of 5 stars to give you a gauge on how much time to spend in each place. Feel free to use the chapter markers. Day 1, start with Singapore Zoo. The Singapore Zoo is roughly arranged in two loops, but you'll be wrong to just be doing one loop after the next, because when you visit the animals, they might be hiding or sleeping. Can you imagine going to the zoo and not seeing any animals? To avoid that, I've designed my itinerary to coincide with many of the feeding sessions and zookeeper talks when the animals are the most active. Following my route will guarantee that you'll see the animals at their most active and the most fun state. The zoo is the least crowded right after opening and before closing. This will be the period where you get to enjoy the zoo much more peacefully. So I would advise to come here as early as when it opens at 8.30 a.m. Once you're inside, look out for the treetop trail boardwalks on your left. You'll catch the Siamang. The Siamang is an endangered gibbon. I'm very confused why they put him here because look who's below. If one day they stop seeing him, the crocs might know where he went. The treetop trail gets a 3.5 out of 5. Next, we're gonna catch the smallest otters in the world. Perhaps also the most adorable. Right outside the treetop trail, you can find the Asian small clawed otters. They really are super adorable. From here, we follow the sheltered walkway on the right. The Gibbon Island will be on our left. Keep your eyes peeled along the tree line because you'll spot some gibbons hanging out. you also spot some pelicans and the red ruffed lemur. They have a very nice fur color and they get very feisty. The Gibbon Island gets a 4 out of 5. Keep moving forward, you will reach the center of the zoo, the Aming restaurant. If you thought that Aming is the owner or the chef of the restaurant, you're wrong. Aming is the zoo's late orangutan. She was so loved for being so friendly. When she passed in 2008, 4,000 people turned up to her funeral. One of Aming's grandchildren, Ishta is over there. Why I love this setup so much is because it's a whole island where the orangutans are free to roam in the island. They look like they're living their daily life. The ones over here are the Borneo orangutans. There's a hut over there that we're gonna go. Those are the Sumatran orangutans. The orangutan area gets a 5 out of 5. Now, we're gonna go to the amphitheater 
where we're gonna watch an animal presentation, the Splash Safari. We are aiming to attend the 1030 show, and as the name suggests, it's a Splash Safari. For the best view, while keeping dry, stick to the middle row, fifth row onwards. You'll be watching Pedro the Sea Lion, who will intrigue you with all his antics. I find the Splash Safari very entertaining, so it gets a 4.5 out of 5. Now, we are going to visit our more distant relatives. Exit via the big gate and head straight into the Primate Kingdom. We will be just in time for the Keeper talk at 11 o'clock. The Keeper will bring you around to meet the residents. And check out this monkey with luscious hair. So what shampoo you, you guys give them? Sorry? What shampoo you guys give them? <laughs> no, they cannot like drink <laughs> water. Like, you know? <laughs> if you ask me, I also don't have that. Fine. Keep your secrets. My favorite animal in the Prima Kingdom is the Duke Langur. They look like they're wearing a colorful suit. For the arrays of primates and their island style exhibit, the Primate Kingdom gets a 4 out of 5. Next, we will be visiting a little piece of Africa. From the Duke Langur area, find this little pathway. It will bring you to the Great Rift Valley of Ethiopia, home to the Hamadrias baboons. There are also cultural exhibits in the area, showcasing the livelihood of the native people and about archaeology. The baboons here are so active and lively, it was such a joy to watch. It's a 4.5 out of 5 for me. Now, we will go back to the Duke Langur area to head to the Elephants of Asia for the 11.30 elephant presentation. I'll share with you one secret, how you can get to feed the elephants for free. In this presentation, you will learn about the elephants and their care routine. There will also be the elephant pop quiz by the keeper. Any audience who gets the answer correctly will get to come forward and feed the elephant. You need to equip yourself with this knowledge. Number one, how long are elephants pregnant for? 18 to 22 months. Why do elephants fan their ears? To cool down their temperature. Why do elephants in Singapore Zoo have no tusk? Because they are all Asian female elephants. You're welcome. Right after the elephant presentation is the feeding session. I think it's worthwhile to join the elephant feeding session because you get to interact with a uniquely gentle, intelligent giant. And for that, the elephants of Asia gets a 4 out of 5. Now, we will head back to the Aming restaurant for a short lunch break. The food here is decent, and the indoor eating area is luxuriously air-conditioned. Feel free to download my custom map and itinerary from my blog. The link is in the description below. Next, the best part of the zoo. Wild Africa. We are aiming to watch the feeding of the white rhinos at 1.15. The feeding area is very close to the public area, so you don't really have to pay to have a good view of the feeding session. Next, catch the zookeeper's talk with the African lion at 1.25. And another zookeeper's talk at the super adorable meerkats at 1.30. Then we're gonna catch the fastest land mammal, the cheetah, with the zookeeper's talk at 1.35. Then the African painted dogs, also a zookeeper's talk at 1.40. Then we are going to join the feeding session with the giraffe. I highly recommend feeding the giraffe because it is done at an exclusive area. You'll be able to interact with the tall giraffe in person on the feeding platform. The way their tongue wraps around the food and pull their food into their mouth. So interesting. I think it's a fantastic experience whether it be it for children or adults. Just look at core memories being created. We're not even done with Wild Africa yet. Ooh. There's still the Red Hog and the Leopard.
then at 2.15, we're gonna watch the zebra feeding session. And that's why the Wild Africa is a 5 out of 5 for me. Next, we're gonna have a roaring time. We'll head back towards Aming's restaurant to catch the tigers. In my first visit to the zoo, I was very excited to see the white tiger. But I was sorely disappointed when the white tiger wasn't even on exhibit. That's when I learned the white tigers and the Malayan orange tigers are on rotation. It was double disappointment for me because the tigers were lazing around at the far end of the exhibit. To avoid getting yourself disappointed, check online to find the tigers and make sure that you visit at 2.40 when there's a scheduled zookeeper talk. I came back another day and caught the beautiful, majestic, white Bengal tiger. Something about their eyes are so captivating. Whether it's the Bengal tiger or the Malayan tiger, the tiger track is still a very cool spot to visit, especially during the Zookeeper talk, because you get to watch the tiger up close. The tiger track gets a 5 out of 5. Next, we're gonna catch the giant river puppy. Just outside the tiger exhibit, you'll see a water tank. This is the home of the pygmy hippo. They're also known as the ballerinas because they'll tiptoe to get around in the water. I find it's not too special here, so it's a 3 out of 5 for me. Our next stop is the reptile's paradise, the reptopia. We will be passing the wild Africa again. This time, you can take your time to look around. Look out for this reptopia sign. You will be treated with a buffet of snakes, lizards, frogs, and even spiders. For the amount of reptiles that you can see in just one place, the Reptopia is a 4.5 out of 5. Next, we are going to a very special place in the zoo where you are the one going into the animal's enclosure. Get out of Reptopia the same way that you came in and take a left. We are in the fragile forest. This is where you get truly be one with nature. You really get to be face to face with all the animals here. There's a section called the Butterfly Dome where you can make your Disney dreams come true. I really enjoyed meeting the animals here. From the flying fox, the friendly photogenic lemur, the shy elusive mouse deer, the lazy two-toed sloth, the saki monkeys, and take in some beautiful birds. The enclosure itself is very beautifully made. The fragile forest gets a 5 out of 5. When you exit the fragile forest, don't miss out the whiskered mini monkey gentleman. Good afternoon, sir. Next, we're gonna see friends of the selfie monkey. Go further straight and you'll find a sheltered glass exhibit housing the Celebus Crested Ape. We are aiming to attend the 415 Keeper Talk. They were quite fun to watch and I like their forehead, so it's a 4 out of 5. Next, we're visiting the movie stars from Planet of the Apes, the Chimpanzees. Exit to the left and you'll find the Chimpanzee Island. We are aiming for the 435 Keeper Talk. I like the Chimpanzee Island, but I find they're not very active. So it's a 3.5 out of 5 for me. Next, continue down the road and take a left. The stars of the show here is the Big Croc, the Komodo Dragons, and the 100 year old tortoises. Next, we are going to the Squidward Monkeys nearby the exit. The proboscis monkey is quite unique, so I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. There are a few things that I intentionally missed out. There is another animal presentation at the amphitheater where you can catch many rainforest animals. To me, it's a 3.5 out of 5, but I feel it's skippable compared to what I planned for the rest of the day. And I think you will need the lunch break. I also skipped the whole of Australasia because it's out of the way and I find there's not that many animals there. 
it's a 2 out of 5 for me. Oof. After a long fun day at the zoo, head back to the entrance and have a quick dinner because we're gonna continue the evening with a party at the night safari. From an overview perspective, there are essentially three things that you can do in the night safari. The walking trails, creature of the night animal show, and the tram ride. Let's get started with our itinerary. Head to the night safari entrance by 6.30pm. Actually, it opens at 7, but sometimes it opens early. So we won't say no to extra time. First, we'll be doing the walking trail, which actually consists of four main trails. In total, it's a one-hour point-to-point walking route along many of the animal exhibits. The first time I was on a walking trail, I was very sad. My animal show was about to start in 30 minutes, but I decided to start walking the trail. Just as I was enjoying my walk, I had to turn back to catch my shoe. To fully enjoy the walking trail, you need to commit the next one hour just to do the walk. Preferably, you also want to clear your bladder because there are only toilets at the start and midpoint of the trail. Or maybe you can just answer nature's call in between the trees in the dark. Probably no one will see you, but <laughs> no, I don't recommend that. We'll start from the fishing cat trail and then go clockwise. We're starting with the walk first because we want to utilize the remaining sunlight to help us spot the animals before it gets too dark. Just compare this view and this view. Which one is easier for you to see things? And here are the stars of the fishing cat trail. The fishing cat himself, the gharials, the giant anteater, Brazilian porcupine, striped hyenas, maint wolf, and this tiny adorable armadillos. Further in, you'll find the Explorer's Outpost. This is actually an animal presentation area. Sometimes, the zookeepers will come here and show off the animals. However, their schedule is not fixed, so if they're not there, we'll just skip it. And don't miss out the newest trail here, the Pangolin Trail. It runs in parallel with the Vision Cat Trail, so you might need to loop around and walk the path twice. But it's a very short distance and definitely worth the walk. After crossing the road, we'll reach the Leopard Trail, which is a little bit confusing to walk. But don't worry, we'll keep it simple. Just stick to the left, we'll cover the bigger loop first. The special attractions here are the enclosures of the Civet and the Flying Fox. They are very worthwhile to visit because you're guaranteed to see the animals there. At this point, it'll be a lot darker than when you first started and you'll start to feel the pain of low visibility at night. The areas inside the enclosures are better lit and with the keeper around, the animals are more active and visible. That's why you'll have a much better time watching the animals in these enclosures. After the civet enclosure, find the lion's lookout. Make sure you take a good look at the lions. This will be important later. Now, here is the midpoint where you can find the toilets. After this point, there will be no more toilets until the end of the trail. My favourite part of the leopard trail is the Indian rhino. Just look at this majestic beast. He's got such a badass armour. You can actually join the rhino feeding session, but I think watching is already cool enough. You also find a few clouded leopard exhibits along the trail. I tried finding them, but I really couldn't, which gave me a new fear. What if I'm stuck in the middle of a jungle? Everything is dark. There's a leopard around. I cannot see him, but he can see me. Now, we're entering the East Lodge Trail. After crossing the road, on your left, you'll find a sloth bear. But it's really dark and it's black colour, so you might have trouble finding him. The coolest animal here is the spotted hyenas. The whole family is so active and so visible. I find them to be the most fun to watch here. It also feels like they can just hop over the gap and eat you up, you know? Also, remember the lions from just now? I hope you took a good look because this is where I learned that there are two types of lions in the world. I've always thought that lions come from Africa. These are the ones you're seeing right now. The lions that we saw before are Asiatic lions that comes from India. There are also white tigers here, but I thought their display window is so small and it's so dark, I didn't really enjoy watching them. If you like watching active animals, this next trail is gonna be a blast. The Tasmanian Devil Trail. At first, the name might be a little scary. Don't worry, there are no devils here, only angels. This trail is named after this red-looking animal that gets its name from the devilish sound that they make. Just take a listen. If I go 
to the forest and I hear this sound at night, I will leave and I'll never come back. Actually, they're quite cute. This trail also has very unique caves displaying many cave-dwelling animals. I was so mind blown by this scorpion that glows in UV light. There's one more spot that a lot of people tend to forget. You can get really close with the bull elephant. When you see the tram stations, cross the road and then take the left. Hi, Chao Ang. Finishing the walking trail should take you about one to one and a half hours, after which you'll find yourself back almost at where you started. Now, we're just in time for the 8.30 p.m. animal show at the amphitheatre. But wait, to watch the animal show, we need to book our seats. Before we even reach the zoo, we need to go to this website and book our seats for the 8.30 p.m. show. Don't be like me, I thought I could just walk in. On my first visit, I got turned away and actually missed my show. Here, I'll show you some snippets of the show so you'll know what you're getting yourself into. Personally, I recommend watching for these three reasons. Number one, it's fantastic to see so many of the nocturnal animals in one sitting. After walking the whole walking trail and squinting into the dark, having the animals to just show up in front of you is really very welcoming. Number two, I really like the show format and the animal tricks are really cool. I can feel that the animals and the keepers have a great working relationship because at one point of the show, Actually, the owl didn't want to do the trick, but the keeper didn't force it to. It's very interesting to witness that the animals are doing the tricks out of their partnership with the keeper rather than out of fear or punishment. It's nice that the animals are very well taken care of. And number three, some of the animals that you see in the Creatures of the Night show cannot be found anywhere else in the zoo. So you have to come and watch if you want to see all the animals. By the way, if you find this video helpful so far, please give it a like so that it can reach more people. Thank you very much. Next, we're gonna catch the rest of the animals on the tram ride. You might have passed by a huge crowd of people queuing for the tram when you walked by earlier on. The queue is crazy long in the early evening. That's why we're only getting onto the tram after we finish our walk and our animal show because by now, the queue should look a little more like this. Just by doing it in the sequence, you already save yourself about 30 minutes to one hour of queuing. The best part is, instead of waiting in line, you will be walking around in the walking trails, watching nocturnal animals under the last light of the evening sun. When getting onto the tram, aim for the front car and sit on the right side. These are the best seats in the tram because you want to be in the front to be able to anticipate the incoming animals and based on the route, the more interesting animals will be on the right side of the road. However, do note that the frontmost car are reserved for handicapped guests. For parents who will be bringing strollers for their children, don't worry, there are luggage space in the back of the tram where you can store your strollers. Now, here are some of the best view from the tram that makes me want to sit again.
What I really like about the tram is that there are some animals that you cannot see unless you take the tram. For example, the Malayan tapir and the deers. As a city boy, it was such a fantastic feeling to drive by herds of grazing deers. Number two, the tram will actually stop at designated spots, giving everyone more time and space to watch and adore the animals. This is a game changer, because imagine if the tram just drive by, right? The experience will feel very rushed. Thanks to my tram driver, who was very watchful and very observant, we were able to spot the tapir, and it was comfortable enough to roam very near to the tram, giving us a very close look of the tapir. Overall, I think the tram is really worth going, especially if you follow my itinerary and avoid the horrendously long queue. Now, go back and get a good rest because the next day, we're gonna have a flying time at the bird paradise. First, let me give you a rundown of the park. Looking at the map, this is what we have. Eight of the main attractions are walk-in aviaries. I've included connecting lines to indicate if they are connected by a pathway. In most of the aviaries, they'll be walking on these boardwalks where the birds fly freely around the area. It's amazing. Although technically they're still within a cage, it's a much happier sight compared to seeing them confined into small cages. The boardwalks are built at the same level as the trees, so you have a very good eye-level view of the birds in the trees. And it's also multi-layered. When you look down, you get a bird's eye view of the ground dwelling bird. Bird's eye view of birds. Who's the bird now, huh? Even more amazing is that all of the aviaries have these large air conditioned areas with lots of interactive display. So you can sit and rest or walk around and learn fun facts about birds. Seriously, the aircon makes daytime visit much more bearable. I've come up with a route that can help you see the most out of your time and energy here. To get the best experience, arrive as soon as the park opens at 9 o'clock. I'm the first in the park! Start with Heart of Africa. The Heart of Africa is the largest out of all the aviaries that are here. It simulates a forested valley in continental Africa. Along the boardwalks, you can find weaver birds and their intricately woven nests. There are even higher platforms to have a view from the canopy. To get a closer look and even interact with the birds in person, you can join their feeding sessions at $8 per person. It's a round shaped feeder, so you can always turn the bird to the angle that you want. Look at that. It was a really nice experience to have the birds perched and eating off your feeding bowl. In my opinion, it's worth the $8 cost price. At the very least, I highly recommend being here to watch the feeding session at 9.30. While the feeding is ongoing, many of the birds will gather here, so it makes it easier for you to watch them. For the beautiful scenery and the fantastic array of lively, colourful birds, this gets a 4.5 out of 5. Next. Follow the boardwalks to Wings of Asia. The Wings of Asia has a familiar oriental theme. Here's my favourite spot, a hut by a terrace of paddy fields. It's so cosy. There are really big birds like the storks and the pelicans. Here you can also join them for a feeding session. But I don't really like the feeding session here. You'll be standing at this high platform while the birds pitifully wait for you to throw some fishes down. You don't really get to interact with the birds personally. It doesn't look like a fun, intimate experience, so I don't recommend joining this one. I like the whole setup here. The Bali-style architecture, the statues and the arches. But the birds just aren't as exotic and lively as the other aviaries. So I'll give it a 4 out of 5. Follow the Bali Arch to get to the Sky Amphitheatre. The Sky Amphitheatre is where you can watch trained birds do tricks while learning fun facts about them. There are two shows here, Predators on Wings and Wings of the World. Each show runs twice a day on this schedule. You should be able to catch the 10.30 show. The Predators on Wings showcase very cool predatory birds, like the American Bald Eagle, 
white-bellied sea eagle, Brahmini kite, the buffy fish owl, king vulture, and the marabou stork. Some of the birds in the park can only be seen in the shows, so if you want to catch them all, you gotta catch the shows. If you have to choose one, the predators on wings is more entertaining. The experience of watching a big eagle up close and having a huge vulture flying overhead was amazing. The show takes about half an hour, after which you can visit the Crimson Wetlands which is just beside the Sky Amphitheatre. The moment I stepped into the Crimson Wetlands, the name made sense. There's a pond full of pink flamingos, coloured ibises and the roseate spoonbills. They were also named by brand new cows going about their lives. Some of the birds here are really playful, like borderline naughty. vibrant, vivid color, and the energy of the inhabitants here, this place gets a 4.5 out of 5. It will be good to catch some rest and some food here. I suggest bringing your own food, maybe some sandwiches, so you can save some money here. Remember to eat outside of the aviaries. For drinking water, you just need to bring your water bottles because there are these dispensers near the toilets where you can refill your water bottle for free. Don't go too far from here because at 12.30, you want to catch the wings of the world at the Sky Amphitheatre. After that, get to the Amazonian jewels via the Crimson Wetlands. This area simulates the Amazonian rainforest. The birds here are very unique. A lot of them have features that you don't normally see in a bird, like this dorky helmeted curassow and the Andean cock of a rock. My favorite bird here is the Toko Tucan. Just look at him with his large orange beak. While it's got unique birds, I feel that the birds here are lacking the energy to make this place feel welcoming. So it's a 3.5 out of 5. Follow the boardwalks, which will bring you to the songs of the forest. This area houses songbirds renowned for their melody. Come, have a listen. I hear the cheerful lorries from the next door more than I hear the songbirds. You can still find some pretty looking birds here. The lorries next door are just too loud for me to enjoy the songs of the forest. So I'll give this place a 3.5 out of 5. Then the lorry loft. There is also a feeding section here that I would recommend, but the timing doesn't match this recommended route. The lorry loft is the most cheerful place in the whole park. There's just so many happy lorries and lorry kids all playing around. You can hear them all chirping. They are so social. I love watching them play with each other. They also play with you. You can also join the feeding sessions, but with your friends, swarmed by hungry lorries. Fitness of a lot and the unique experience of being assaulted by tens of birds. This place is a 4.5 out of 5. Keep following the boardwalks and you will reach the mysterious Papua.
This area simulates the lowland forest of Papua. The star of this area is the Southern Cassowary. You can fit the huge cassowary in a feeding session. But it's 1pm, so it'll be too rushed for this route. It was really cool to see it up close and watch it gobble up big fruits. While the scenery is great and the cassowary bird is magnificent, I feel like they need more birds here. So I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. Continuing on, you will reach the Australian Outback. The Australian Outback simulates the Australian Outback. My favourite bird here is the tawny frogmouth. Check out this super weird bird. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a wannabe bird wallaby. I feel that the Australian outback is a bit dry. There aren't as many birds that you can find here compared to the other aviaries. So I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. Keep going, then you'll reach the penguin cove. Penguin Cove is a multi-storey indoor aviary recreating the Antarctic environment where penguins can happily dive and swim. It feels so magical to watch them play. Feels like they are aware of how awestruck the children and the adults were. They would come near the glass divider to give us a good show. For the playful penguins and the very cool setup here, it's a 4 out of 5. If you're exhausted at this point, there's a nice air-conditioned cafe where you can recharge with the full view of the playful penguins. If you want to see big birds, visit the Wing Sanctuary before you go. The Wing Sanctuary houses their birds in cages made out of this light netting. You can find the park's bigger hornbill collections here. You can also find some toucans and other smaller colourful birds. I do understand that it could be dangerous to be in a walk-in aviary with one of these. One wrong move, I might lose an eye. And for the birds that are endangered, we might be a danger to them. At least the cages look big enough for them. Anyway, compared to the other aviaries, I'll give it a 3 out of 5. Next, let's have an immersive experience at the River Wonders. By 4pm, exit Bird Paradise and follow this sign. Get down this escalator to find this bus stop and take any bus for one stop to get to Mandai East. For a quick overview, there are essentially six parts of River Wonders. The Seven Rivers, the Panda Pen, the Once Upon a River Animal Show, the Amazon River Quest, the Amazonia Encounter, and the Flooded Forest. You can start this itinerary anytime after opening and before 4pm. We'll be going clockwise, or is it like this for you guys? <laughs> After passing through the ticket gantry, take a left turn. In the seven rivers, you'll find big tanks full of fishes from the seven famous rivers around the world. My personal favourites are the giant catfishes in the Mekong River because it's such an awesome sight to see those giant fishes swimming over me. The armoured sturgeons from the Yangtze River, their distinctive bony plates made them look so badass. And I found something so funny. There's a tank with a false gharial and a turtle. And the turtle was riding the false gharial. I think they're friends. Maybe even best friends. You will likely spend about 30 fun minutes watching the fishes in the seven rivers. Right after the Yangtze River, we'll meet the animal that single-handedly propped up global wildlife conservation. The giant panda. Seriously, if they are not this cute, half of the world's wildlife would have gone extinct. Just look who's in the WWF logo. 
Our local pandas, Jia Jia and Kai Kai, lives in this luxuriously air-conditioned panda pen, beautifully furnished to mimic their natural bamboo forest habitat. The super adorable red panda also lives here. They are also known as the Firefox. The Firefox is cute, but I'm still gonna use my Google Chrome. I love staying in the panda pen. In fact, I recommend stay 30 minutes in the panda pen to adore the pandas while you cool down from the heat. When the pandas are active, oh, they're so adorable. As you can see, the red pandas are very active, but the giant pandas are the complete opposite. After exiting the panda pen, cross the bridge and go to where Once Upon a River Animal Show is at. I'll show you some snippets of the show, see if you can find the problems that I have with it. Then I'll share with you my reasons why I think this is not worth your time. So personally, the stage is very, very poorly lit. It makes it very difficult to see the animals and the presenters because the backlight from the sun is very strong. Compare this with the lighting at Singapore Zoo or Bird Paradise, the difference is phenomenal. A lot of the sitting areas in front are also at the same level, so if you're sitting there, you're probably watching the head of the person in front of you most of the time. And I didn't really enjoy the chemistry between the presenters. The energy didn't feel right and the jokes didn't really land. And for those reasons, I'm out. I think it's not worth your time, especially if you're planning to visit any of the other zoos in Mandai. There are a lot of pelicans in bird paradise. And you wanna see snakes? Go to Singapore Zoo, Reptopia. You can see a hundred snakes there. And you know what? There's also an otter show at Singapore Zoo. But the otter actually finished the job before leaving. Of all the animal shows in all of the zoos, I'll skip this one. Rangers, if you're watching this, I'm not really sorry because it's not that you're bad. It's just that all your peers are so damn good. I'll be very happy to go down for a re-review if things has changed. Maybe this is subjective to me, so if you still want to go, you can check it out. Just make sure that you book your seat for the animal presentation. Booking opens two hours before the show timing. Beside the Once Upon the River, you'll find the Amazon River Quest. For an additional $5, you can hop on a little boat which will sail you down the stream and you can watch animals along the way. Just like a mini river safari. But I also don't recommend going for this. I have another separate video explaining my reasons, so I don't want to repeat too much. In short, the boat ride is too fast and it's not enjoyable to view the animals like that. But if you still want to go, you can buy the boat tickets online anytime before you start your queue. Further down the boardwalk, you'll find Amazonia Encounter on your left. Here, you'll be walking into the animal's enclosure. You'll find the animals such as the agouti, white-lipped tamarind, and helmeted curasso. I think this is meant to simulate the Amazon jungle, but I feel that the whole area is too small to feel like I'm in a jungle. 
fact, I think I finished walking through the whole round in just 15 minutes. If you've been to the Amazonian Jewel at Bird Paradise, you can just skip this part. I feel bad. This itinerary essentially tells you to skip half of the whole River Wonders. <laughs> well, it's an honest review and it's for you. So take it as you want it. Okay, this next one, you cannot skip. The Flooded Forest. This is what puts the wonder in River Wonders. You'll first pass under this tunnel of giant otters. These playful otters really love to show off their acrobatic moves in the water. And this underwater tunnel is the perfect place to watch them frolic. They're also very interactive and will chase your hand if you wave towards them. These children went berserk when they realized that the otters were chasing their hands. They seriously love this. And it gets better when you get deeper into the flooded forest. Further in, you'll find the biggest tank in River Wonders housing the manatees, also known as the cows of the seas. My favorite moment was when the crowd died down and I'm left alone all these giants swimming overhead. Following the pathway, you'll spiral upwards to get to see the top-down view of the tank. There are also very colorful arrays in the shallow pools at the top level. In and out, you'll probably take about 30 minutes to explore the whole flooded forest. All right, let's recap. Day one, you have the Singapore Zoo and then night safari. Day two, you have the bird paradise followed by river wonders. Easy. Now, let's dive into the most frequently asked questions. Will the birds in bird paradise poop on me? <laughs> Maybe, but personally, the few times that I've been there, I haven't get hit. Is it possible to visit all the four zoos in one day? Short answer is yes. Long answer is maybe you shouldn't. You've already seen how packed our two days itinerary is. Can you imagine doing all that in half the time? If you're gonna do everything in one day, you will miss out on a lot of contents in each zoo while still paying the full ticket price. You'll also be on a very tight and very tiring schedule. But if after all this warning, you still wanna do it in one day, Here's the modified itinerary for you. Start your morning at Bird Paradise at 9 a.m. We'll be following the same route. You might still be able to catch the feeding session at the heart of Africa, but you'll need to skip all the shows at the Sky Amphitheater. Depending on your pace, you can also catch the 11 a.m. feeding session at the Lorry Loft. Aim to leave the Bird Paradise by 12 p.m. to get to the Singapore Zoo. Have a quick lunch before getting in. Walk through the treetops trail before heading towards the Wild Africa by 1.15 p.m. to catch the sequence of keeper talks. I still recommend buying the add-on experience to fit the giraffes because otherwise you cannot get up there and be in close person with the giraffes. Then continue anti-clockwise and finish the right loop. Once you're back at the arming restaurant, take a right and we'll be doing the left loop clockwise. Stick to the left of the forest lodge starting from the tiger track. This should allow you to catch the 4.30 elephant show. After the elephant show, exit the Singapore Zoo and we're going straight to River Wonders. Follow the same itinerary. After meeting the pandas, cross the river. Depends on how much time you have, you can choose to go to the show, Amazon River Quest or the Amazonian Encounters. But all those are optional. The most important thing is for you to have at least half an hour to visit the flooded forest. Exit River Wonders and catch a quick dinner before getting to the night safari at 7 p.m. Follow the same route as the ideal route in night safari. So book your show, go for a hike, come back for your show, then take the tram. And ta-da! You've completed four zoos in one day. How do you feel now? A little bit exhausted maybe? Yeah, that's why I don't really recommend doing all the zoos this way because it's such a waste. You're in such an amazing place and yet you're rushing all over the place. Ha. However, I understand that you may only have one day to spend at the zoos. In that case, I recommend just picking Singapore Zoo or Bird Paradise to do during the day and then spend the evening at the night safari. Just keep River Wonders. This way, at least you get to enjoy your time fully and you get the most out of your ticket money. Between Singapore Zoo and Bird Paradise, if you've never been to a major zoo before, go to Singapore Zoo. If you've never experienced a walk-in aviary, pick Bird Paradise. Next, the most important part, getting your tickets. Can I buy my tickets on site? Nope. As you can see, there aren't any physical ticketing booth in the zoo. You can only buy your tickets online. There are some public devices that you can use to buy your ticket online, 
But the bigger problem is, some of the experiences in the zoo have limited availability. So you might end up missing out on epic feeding sessions or the entry ticket for the day might have already sold out. To avoid disappointment, as soon as you confirm the date of your visit, book your tickets online. Which brings us to the next question. Which ticket and where should you buy from to get the best price? Let's do a ticket comparison. This is how much Manda is charging for individual tickets and this is how much they are charging for the multi-park bundles. Each of the multi-park bundles are flexible within 7 days of entry. To compare apple to apple, let's calculate the price per person per park. So indeed, if you buy the 4 park bundle, you essentially get to visit each zoo at $27.50, which is a great price. But if you want even more flexibility, there's a ticket bundle that includes other popular attractions like the Singapore Fire and the Sea Aquarium. At Klook, you can buy a bundle for up to 10 attractions. And of course, I've also calculated the price per person per attraction for your perusal. So, for example, if you want to visit 3 of the zoos and 3 other attractions, you can buy the 6 attraction bundle which nets you around $35.50 per attraction. Which is a good price because most of the individual tickets will cost you above $40. You'll have up to 15 days to activate your pass and another 30 days to visit all your attractions. It's plenty of time. One downside of buying the bundles is that if you want to join the feeding sessions, you'll have to purchase the add-ons separately. Get to the Manda website and buy all the add-ons that you want to experience. If you find this guide helpful, please consider buying the tickets using my affiliate link. I'll get some commissions which will help me make more travel guides like this. Thank you very much. I'll also put my Klook discount code in the description to help you get better deals. Now, where is the best place to eat? In Mandai East, the biggest area inside the Singapore Zoo is the Amings restaurant. There's an air-conditioned area and a bigger sitting area outside. I've eaten there before, it's quite decent. They sell a mixed selection of local cuisine. At the entrance of River Wonders, there is Starbucks. Inside the River Wonders, there's a panda-themed mixed cuisine restaurant, the Mama Panda Kitchen. Inside the night safari, there's a huge food area called the Ulu Safari Restaurant, selling quite a mix of food options. They actually open at 5.30pm, so you can get inside the night safari earlier just to eat. For bigger choices, including desserts, right in front of the Singapore Zoo, there's a big food area with a few stalls, the Chawang Bistro, selling western and local fusion type food, Chomel Bistro selling more Indian flavours, Inuka Cafe for sweets and desserts, and even a KFC and a Hagen dazs In Mandai West, there are a lot more interesting options. Outside the zoo areas, along these beautifully bamboo-roofed walkways, you can find a &W serving American fast food, Hans Union serving combination of Asian and Western cuisine. So far, I've had the best experience eating at the Hans Union. I like the options and their price is the most competitive around here. The flavour is also pretty good. There is also the Birds of Paradise ice cream parlour. Personally, this is my favourite ice cream brand, so I recommend go ahead and try one of their flavour. Old Chunky Coffee House selling more local flavours. Another Starbucks selling Starbucks. Banana Leaf Pavilion selling Indian cuisine, Collins, a Western grill, Unpacked, selling groceries, and Big Cafe food. And inside of Bird Paradise, you get a lot more scenic option like the Crimson Restaurant. The very special thing about the Crimson Restaurant is that while you eat, you get to enjoy the view of the whole Crimson wetlands. But too bad, I cannot afford to eat here today. It's easy to miss because you need to take the stairs or the lift to level 2 to get to the restaurant. And there's also the food central. The interior looks really good. It's also air-conditioned. It's just like a standard Singapore food court. And there's a cafe at the Penguin Cove where you can watch the penguins as you eat your lunch. They sell penguins, sandwiches, pastries and desserts. At the lower level, you'll also find the Penguin Cove restaurant that sells western-style food. 
There's so many options. Where should you eat? Personally, I recommend just eating wherever you're at when it's lunchtime, or bring your own food and have a picnic at the rest areas. But beware of the wild monkeys. Do not feed them, do not show them your food. They will attack. Have your fill, have a good rest, and get back to the zoo experience. Anyway, if you prefer to eat outside of the zoo and come back in again later, just show them your ticket again. You are allowed to re-enter on your day of visit. Is the zoo suitable for family with children? Yes, very suitable. In bird paradise, your children can even have fun without meeting any birds. There's a high element, treetop themed playground with trampolines. It looks really fun, even for me. <laughs> Most of the pathways are also very wide, very easy to push your strollers on. If you're taking the trams, don't worry, you can fold up your strollers and put it at a good space at the back. And at the show areas, there are dedicated parking areas for your strollers. What's the best time to visit? As much as possible, try to visit on the weekdays. Look at this. This is a weekday traffic. You almost have to park all to yourself. If you have to choose between Saturday and Sunday, Sunday night is better for night safari. What is the best way to get here? One huge downside of the zoos is that it's very far from everywhere. So if your budget allows, the most convenient way to get here is via a taxi. The more affordable option is the Mandai Katip shuttle that will bring you from the train station directly to the zoo. But it's only available from the Katip train station. The most affordable is still public transport, but be ready to transfer between buses and trains. When getting out of the zoo, there's an additional option that takes you directly back into town. On Thursdays to Sundays, for $8, the shuttle can bring you from the zoo directly to Orchard and Marina Bay areas. And take note, if you're planning to take a taxi out of the zoo, there's a $5 surcharge. Since you're already in Singapore, how about check out the top 18 places to go over here. I'll see you there.